Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to my presentation, uh, Hurt Your Boards, Become a Farmer. My name is Geert Uiterhoeven. For the people who do not speak Dutch, uh, my last name actually means from the farm, so I'm uh, going back to my roots. Uh, so uh, I started with working on Linux uh, a long time ago, more than 20 years ago, uh, for uh, the port to M6 of uh, Linux M68K to the Amiga. Uh, after that, I worked on porting Linux PowerPC on the common hardware reference platform, which is something that has mostly died since then. And uh, for a while, I've been uh, the Linux framework for device uh, maintainer. All of that was mostly hobbyist work. So not for money. <laughs> and then uh, in the meantime, I started working for Sony. And in 2006, I started working at Sony on uh, working on Linux, running on the PlayStation 3 uh, game console and the cell uh, broadband engine uh, processor. In 2013, I uh, became a freelance uh, Linux kernel developer. And I've been mostly doing uh, upstream work for the kernel for the Renesas ARM SOCs. So why would you want uh, a board farm? So most people, they start with getting a board. They put it on their desk. It's easy to set up. It's easy to interact with. You want to power on the board, flip a switch. You want to reset it. You, you want to look at uh, the heartbeat LED, all easy. But after a while, these days, many development boards are quite cheap. So after a while, you start getting more and more and more boards, and they start outgoing your desk. If they have loud fans, then they will start making too much noise. If you're working from home, like I do, there may be other people in the house who do not like a stack of boards on your desk visible uh, from the living room or something like that. So uh, I would like to know. Are there here people who have a board on their desk? <laughs> Anyone with three boards on his desk? <laughs> More than five? Who has a board farm? Hmm. That's good. So after a while, you start thinking, I should put the boards somewhere else. It's, you have less clutter on your desk. You can centralize everything in one place in your house if you have really lots of boards. You can start automating things. Uh, thanks to the internet, you can just access the boards from anywhere, from your, from your house, from your garden, from uh, the coffee shop, from the other side of the world. Uh, you can start providing access to your boards to other people. There are no limitations. Of course, there are a few challenges about that. So it's more complex to set up than just putting a board on your desk and connecting it to your local PC. But the biggest issue is how can you interact with your boards? If it's close to you, you can flip switches, look at displays, uh, whatever. Uh, so I will be mostly talking about the actual setup and all the, the challenges you have, and only a little bit about the, the software and the, the higher level things. Um, what do you want in a board farm? So the basic stuff you need is you need to be able to power on and off the board and have a serial console so you can look whether it's booting well. And that's mostly what many of the kernel CI boot testing tests are doing. But uh, I wanted some, something better. So I wanted real reset support. So in, I've seen me several bugs where that you could not see when power cycling the board. You really had to press the reset button. Or bugs that you cannot see by, by, doing, by typing a reboot command or something like that. 
For that, you need access to the reset button, which is a bit inconvenient if it's not on your desk anymore. Uh, other things are uh, wake up after suspend. If you want to, to check that, you have to, to provide some uh, a wake up source. Uh, soft power on, it's, it's all, so several boards have a special button to power it on. And that all, that pressing that button is different than power cycling the board, so you want to be able to test that well. You may have other buttons you want to pr press, and I wa also want to have at least some idea about power consumption of the boards. There could be more advanced things you can do, you want to do with your board. It depends on the use case. Some people are working on graphics, multimedia. They need video in and video out. But these are really specialized solutions, and there may be other things that you want to do. So now I'll look a bit at the building blocks of your board form. If you just have one board, it's easy. You, you, need, you need to provide power, you connect the serial console connected to the network, and then you have interaction, which can be various things, pressing buttons, looking at screens, uh, yeah, you name it. If you have a board form, it's almost the same. Huh? You just have more boards here in the middle. So now I'll go over the different uh, four components we have over there. I'll start with power control. So a classical solution for powering, power cycling boards is uh, a device like shown there. So you just plug in the power, the power cables there and you can control the device. You can switch it on and off. Some of them provide metering. It's a great solution, but it's overkill for many low-powered embedded boards. You can switch your, your freezer or, or a heater or something with that, but if you have a board that consumes only one or two watts, it's, uh, it's a bit of overkill. A second solution people are using are the relay boards. Uh, you can control them through multiple interfaces. There are some, uh, they're available with uh, control over GPIO, I2C, USB, Ethernet. Uh, I heard horror stories about people that bought two of them and then discovered that they all had the same MAC address, <laughs> <laughs> which is a little bit uh, more difficult. Uh, it can still be overkill for many boards because these relays can switch 250 volts at 10 ampere, which you may not need. Another solution is the, the nice device that Bay Libre created, uh, the Acme. So it's uh, basically a cape for the beagle bone black. You attach it on top of a beagle bone black. But since it just uses I2C, you can connect it to any other development board that has I2C. You can attach two of them to beagle bone black. Each board has eight interfaces for controlling and monitoring uh, slave boards. So you can have up to 16 boards with one beagle bone black. <coughs> it's not that bad. So uh, there has, exist several probes that you can connect to the small uh, connectors I, I just pointed to at the top of the board. So one of them is uh, the, the jack power control board. So it has two uh, St fairly standard DC jacks. Power goes in on one side, power goes out on the other side. It works for uh, a wide range of voltages. Uh, it can switch up to six ampere of current. And uh, you can, it can also measure power consumption. There's a, a second device for USB power devices. You have a mini USB B going in and plain USB A going out. For many embedded boards, it's good. It may not be good enough to switch your mainframe, but uh, most people are not working on that in this room, I guess. And there also exists a probe for just measuring power. So uh, it has this little connector that you can connect to a measurement resistor on the board. And they also have a temperature probe. But I haven't tried that one yet. So power consumption, you can measure that by uh, knowing the the voltage and the current flowing into the device. Voltage can be easily measured. Current you have to calculate, so uh, all the probes for the bit of DJ, C jack and uh, USB, they, they contain a, a small measurement resistor and the device measures the voltage across the register, uh, just across the resistor and then it can calculate the current and then use Ohm's law to calculate the power consumption. Uh, yeah, you can use that for whole boards, but with uh, 
the last probe here, you can also measure uh, individual power rails on a board or power going to one component or something like that. That sounds like a very interesting device. The second building block in your system will be a serial console. Uh, some boards still have uh, legacy DB9 or DB25 serials, so you, you're going to use the USB serial for that these days. Uh, some boards have pin headers for UARTs. Some have an onboard USB to serial converter. For 96 boards, you have the 96 board UART expansion board. So in general, this is going to be a, a USB-based solution. So you're going to need a USB hub with uh, many ports. So for Kevin Hillman, that was uh, 80 boards, I think, <laughs> he had. To easily access the serial consoles, uh, you can use the uh, UDEF rules to pin uh, DEF TTY something names to actual boards. Um, an example is shown uh, there. You have to be careful with USB serial adapters. So I have several boards that have actually the same serial number in the USB to <laughs> serial <laughs> chip. Uh, fortunately, unlike for Ethernet, you can address USB devices by topology using uh, DEF serial by part, so you can easily identify them. Of course, if you rearrange the connectors in your switch, then the paths change. But it's easier to work around and uh, work around identical MAC addresses. Another component of your system will be a network. So in, that's mostly going to be an Ethernet switch and a wireless access point. That's not so different than normal Linux machines, so I'm not going to say much more about it. Fourth component is interaction. This is the most difficult one. It's be mostly be about I'll talk mostly about input and control. Output is uh, a bit difficult. Uh, screen output, things like that. Looking at LEDs. So be, if you go beyond uh, the serial console, it uh, becomes quite complicated. And um, for, for for graphics and multimedia, you may require you have to use your creativity and uh, build custom solutions. Uh, if you really want to handle that. Um, for interaction, you usually have switches on the board and buttons. You can have them for to reset the board, to wake it up, power it on. You may have a keypad. And you have usually several different inputs on a board that you can use to interact with it. The easiest ones are the the, f the female or the male headers, like you see here on the BeagleBone Black, they, uh, they exist in 2.54 millimeter variant, and there's some boards also have 2 millimeter. They are can be a little bit more challenging if you need a, a connector and not just uh, a few uh, uh, hookup wires. Example of the latter is here from uh, the Dragon board. Um, let me, uh, uh, sometimes you may have an unpopulated header on the board that's actually not that difficult to handle. You can, on the picture here, you see, you see one unpopulated header and here a header where I, that I soldered in myself, uh, so you can easily attach uh, a jumper wire there. On some boards, you have a reset available, on, or for example, on a, on a test point, and then you can use a, a test clip or a, a hook to connect the wire there and control it remotely. Um, some boards only have high density connector breakout, uh, connectors. They are a bit more difficult to handle. Fortunately, you can buy some adapters for it. They're usually quite expensive because it's for specialized uh, connectors. <laughs> the alternative is that you try to build something yourself, which, uh, which is what I did here on uh, on a protoboard. So on the top, I glued a connector, and then I soldered in these tiny wires. And on the other side of the board, I soldered on a, a header. If you want to go this route, then this, uh, the extreme wiring on the prototyping board web page is a very interesting one. And it has also some nice movies of uh, really advanced stuff that some people can do with the soldering iron. Um, here I have some tips and tricks. Uh, if you don't have a, a header, where the reset signal is available, for example, you can solder 
a cable to the switch or some other component. Uh, something I also use is that uh, on the, if there's a JTAG connector, it has a reset line. On some boards, that's only connected to the CPU, but on other boards, it's just connected to the system reset, so you can use that instead. Um, to wake up a board from suspend from RAM, you just need a free GPIO somewhere or an interrupt line. And you don't have to use the switches that you have on the board. So with some small modifications to the DT, you can convert any GPIO that's available on an expansion connector to, to, a, to a button that provides a signal you want, like wake up or uh, key A or 1 or uh, 7 or whatever you want. So you can use that to avoid having to, to solder a wire to a switch on a board. Uh, there are some things to watch out for. Usually, switches uh, assert a signal by grounding it, but there are some cases where uh, you have to pull it up high. And then the question is which voltage? Because on some boards you have 1.8 volt, you also have 3.3, 5 volt. Uh, we have to be careful there. And uh, I actually had uh, one board with an interesting connector that provided all signals I needed. <coughs> But one signal had to be pulled up high, and the connector didn't provide any positive voltage. So I had to get it somewhere else. And that's why, why I had here this uh, red wire going to a, a positive voltage somewhere else. All the other uh, pins I just had to, to pull, pull down to, to assert them. Uh, here I have an example of just how you can add uh, an arbitrary GPIO pin and convert it into a wake-up key, so you don't have to solder anything to the, the real wake-up key on the board. But it's just uh, for reference. Now you have all these uh, signal inputs. You have identified for all boards in your farm how you can control them. Of course, you still have these wires going there, and then you have to send a, si a signal there. So you may think, I have lots of GPIOs on uh, develop another development board, so I can use that to, con to assert the signals. You can do that with or without a driving transistor or MOSFET, but usually that's not such a good idea because you don't have isolation between the, the board controlling the boards and all the other boards in the farm. A second solution is using one of the relay boards. So a relay is basically just an electromagnetically controlled switch. So you the current goes to the coil here, and then it changes the switch there. So you could use that to control any signal going into the board. It provides very good isolation. You can get relay boards from, uh, from a shop or from the internet. Disadvantages are that uh, you have the clicking sound when the <laughs> relay switches, so you may not want to hear clicks all day. And still, they may be overkill for input signals, because usually the relays are, are designed to switch higher current uh, signals than what you need for uh, a simple input switch on a board. Another solution you could use is uh, an opto-isolator or an opto-coupler, which is basically just uh, an LED and the phototransistor in the same package. So you drive the, the LED like any other LED with a current resistor, uh, <laughs> limiting resistor in series. And when a light comes out, it's detected here. And this here, you can um, assert a signal on a, on a board. This provides some isolation, less than a relay, but usually good enough. Uh, an advantage is that you can use this to switch whatever voltage signals that you usually use on an embedded board. If needed, you can still add a relay after the phototransistor. One thing to watch out for is uh, polarity of the signals. So since this is a phototransistor, so the, the ground should be connected here. If you have to uh, pull a signal low, if you have to pull a signal high, then the positive voltage should go there. And actually, this is a solution that I used for uh, the board form I, uh, I uh, made myself. So on the proto board, I, made, uh, I put some uh, optocouplers. You can see them here at the, at the top. So these are uh, modules with four optocouplers in e each package. So I have eight in total. Then I used the uh, I2C uh, GPIO expander. 
so I can connect it to uh, I square C bus on uh, on the Beagle Bone Black that I had for the ACME. So uh, connectors here are for the I square C. I have a, I can daisy chain them. I have two connectors, some LEDs to monitor what's going on, and I got two of those boards so I can can control 16 signals uh, in my form. Then the final component in your form will be your uh, management host, which has to control all the blocks that, uh, that I saw before, provide some services. Uh, in the past, people usually used some, uh, just an old PC or some uh, embedded uh, x86 boards for that. But these days, uh, embedded development boards with ARM CPUs and, and such, they are becoming powerful enough to handle that. So you could use a, a spare BeagleBone Black or Raspberry Pi or whatever you are flying around to control that. Um, this is something uh, I use for the BeagleBone Black. So it has a, a serial console on a mail header where you can just connect a standard FTDI uh, USB serial cable. But the problem with the BeagleBone Black is if you add a, a cape on top of it, then the, you can no longer easily access that connector. You can. So I used uh, some things called pogo pins. These are spring-loaded pins, and connect them to the standard FTDI cable. And if you then put the BeagleBone Black on top, push it down, and make sure that it stays that way, then you can have a console while the cape is uh, connected. I will talk a bit about uh, how I power the board. So this is uh, a bird's view, not related to Tim, about uh, <laughs> about the farm I currently have. So at the center here, I have uh, Beagle Bone Black. Then I have one, two, three, <coughs> four, five, six development boards. Um, Ethernet switch, USB hub, um, USB to serial with four, four ports. And these are the two Boards with optocouplers are used to control the input signals on the various boards. And then if you look carefully, you should see the power probes for the ACME. There are here the small PCBs here. So this is still more or less a, a prototype. I decided to start building it on a table to see how much space I really need. And the idea is to move it to some rack or a closet or something better later. One thing that's missing here and you don't see is the power supply. So that will be the next section. So usually a board comes with a power supply. And then you have to insert them all in a, some power, uh, power bar. And then you get the rat's nest. This is actually This is actually a, a bad picture of a rat's nest. Since I don't use this solution, I didn't have one readily available, so I created a mock-up, but it looks, looks too clean for reality. But if you have eight boards and an Ethernet switch and a USB hub and a BeagleBone Black and whatever, then this is a bar with 11 outlets, but because usually the wall wards are a bit too big, you're gonna need at least two of them to have everything. So I was wondering, can we improve upon and do something cleaner? So most boards either take five or 12 volts, at least the ones I have. But they use different power connector types. Uh, you can have different voltages on the same connector type. You have different polarities. So the, the jack shown here, that's the most popular one. And that's also the one that's supported by the the ACME uh, jack uh, power probes. Um, most are center positive, which means that the pin is the positive voltage, but not all of them. And you have to be careful, of course. <laughs> A second type of connector you, you see regularly is the, the Japanese EIAJ connector. Um, the standard says it's center positive. There are five different types of it. And it's, it's really nice because they have 
the types for different voltages and they designed the connectors in such a way that you cannot insert a number four in a number two uh, socket, for example. So you cannot uh, make mistakes. That's good. Does anybody know what uh, 96 boards use as a power connector? Which one? No, nobody tried. It's the number three. But they. <laughs> Be careful, don't insert the power supply for the 96 boards that jack into some other board that uses a, a number three connector because you may provide too much, uh, too high voltage. Um, and some boards use uh, USB power. For several of those jacks, you're going to need a conversion uh, cable or an adapter if you want to use it with the ACME because the power probes only support uh, the most common uh, power jack. And if it's, you have a, a, a center negative board or something like that, then you have to, to make your own cable, probably. So if you have many boards that don't need much power and they have the same power connector, then you, you could, for example, use a powered USB hub. If, if you have a, a beer wheel of uh, Raspberry Pis, they don't consume that much power, so you can power them from USB hub. If you have boards with uh, the DC jack, and they all use the same voltage and they don't use more than two ampere, then you can use a, a splitter like is shown here. So usually the, if you go for, uh, buy a splitter, they don't advertise how much current can go through it. So if you have a higher power boards, be careful. So what I, I was looking into having a single power supply instead. It would make things much easier. So I, I went over uh, what do I need? So I had eight boards, the management host and control hardware, and I added up the numbers and I arrived at 13 ampere for 5 volt or tw and 28 ampere for 12. 12 volt was what I needed in total. Those are absolute maximum ratings based on the power adapters I had for the, the various boards. I thought about getting a lab power supply, uh, but usually they don't provide such high currents. They're also not that cheap. Uh, so I was thinking about getting a PC power supply. And that sounds nice. PC power supply has multiple output voltages. Usually it provides five. It has five volts for you. 12 volts. On some older power supplies, you may have two different separate rails for 12 volts. So you have to be a bit careful if you that you don't uh, connect them together. A uh, PC power supply also has some other voltages you may have a use for or not, like 3.3 volt would be useful for a, for a Texas Instrument Launchpad or something like that. May also provide minus 12 volt, but that's not so useful these days anymore. Nobody uses the real RS-232 anymore. Oh, a power, PC power supply also provides a few interesting features for a uh, management host. So it provides uh, 5 volts of standby power that's usually limited to 2 or 2.5 ampere, but it's more than enough to power a Beaglebone Black. And a PC power supply has a soft power on. Yes, it's a power on signal. If you tie it to ground, then it will power on. If it's not tied to ground, it'll be power off, but the standby power is still there, so your management host can keep on running. There are some things you have to be watch out for with the PC power supply. Especially with older ones, they don't want to power on if there's not enough load on the, on the power rails. Uh, you could add some load, like uh, some uh, high power uh, load resistors or power Ethernet switch or something like that. But the newer ones uh, work fine with zero load. So the one I got, it advertised as having Haswell C6, C7, zero load support. And if it has that, then it means that it should just uh, work without any load at all. Um, the PC power supply you also have to watch out for voltage stability and the impact of load on uh, the different power rails because you may have more load on the 12, lots of load on the 12 volt line and not on the 5 volt line if you have only a few plus 5 volt uh, power boards and many 12 volt power boards. But with modern power supplies, it's not so much of an issue anymore. Uh, most of them, they, they have a single rail for 12 volt and they down convert that with the DC-DC converter to 3.3 or 5 volt. So all of those rails will be stable all the time. 
uh, even if the 5 volt that you supply to a board is not that stable, it's not so much an issue because most SOCs don't run at 5 volt anymore. They, the boards have their own uh, power management chip that uh, con down converts it to a lower voltage. So if the fluctuations on the 5 volt line, it will just w still work fine. Boards that do need five, a stable 5 volt, for example, for USB, they typically take F12 volt inputs and create the 5 volt themselves. It's also not an issue. Uh, I don't know whether there are boards that really need plus 12 volts, maybe for old RS-232, but even that doesn't have to be that stable. You do have to consider that after you turn on the power supply, that it takes a while before the, the 5 volt and the 12 volt rails stabilize. <coughs> so you'd want to turn it, the power supply on first and afterwards the boards and for powering down you do it the other way around. PC power supplies, they do provide a power OK signal, which you could use to automate that, but just some small delay loop is uh, usually good enough. Um, when using a PC power supply, you have to be careful because it involves high, high currents. You think it's, oh, it's low voltage, only 12 volts. What can happen? But still, if you get that. 650 watt PC power supply, it can supply 52 ampere on the 12 volt rail, which is quite a lot. So it's more than my induction stove, but that run, doesn't run from 12 volt. But it's, so you need really thick wires. And PC power supply provides lots of small wires, and you do not want to connect everything on one wire. You want to combine them in some good way. Um, and still be handy to use a modular power supply, which is one where you can detach some of the, the power cables because you're, you're not going to need all of them. And usually only a few of them, if you combine them, it's good enough for, for all current. For additional safety, you can add fuses, fuses for the individual boards. So power supplies, they, they have to handle short circuits. But uh, if you accidentally have a short circuit, make a short circuit on your uh, Raspberry Pi, and it tries to, to send 20 ampere to the small traces on the board, then it will probably die. When you go from a thick wire to a thin wire, you usually want to add a fuse just to, be, to play safe. Other useful things to consider, if you, you use, you're going to need the Ethernet switch in your, uh, your board form, uh, try to find some with a 12 volt input so you can easily power it from the same power supply as all the rest. Some of them work on 7.5 volt, but it's easier if you, you only have dev devices that need 12 or 5 volts. USB hubs usually need 5 volts, so that's uh, easy to handle. Um, as I said before, on the modern power supplies, they usually create everything from the 12 volt rail. Um, and if you look at power, PC power supply specs, the 5 volt is usually limited to 20 or 25 ampere, whether you buy a 450 watt power supply or 800 watt, because most modern PC motherboards don't need more load on the on the 5 volt line. They they create everything from the, the 12 volt line. So if you have lots of development boards in your farm that need 5 volts, you may consider adding a DC DC converter convert uh, from 12 volt to 5 volt yourself. This is a picture from what I used for uh, power distribution. So on uh, the left, you have lots of wires coming from the PC power supply. Then I have some barrier strips hidden here. I, I can, I'll show them, them better in the next picture. I have fuses for the individual boards. And I have more barrier strips to convert from, uh, from here to the various cables going to the development boards. Uh, as embedded stuff only looks nice when you have displays and LEDs. I added some cheap voltmeters to the different power rails. So the, the blue one is the, the standby voltage. You have the 12 volt line, the 5 volt line, and the, the so far unused 3.3 volt line. So I can have some visual idea of what's going on in the, on the board. Here, I have a question. Have you ever melted one of your Legos? Uh, no. <laughs> So far, I haven't killed anything except uh, a pin of an optocoupler and not being that careful when removing it from the dip socket. Uh, but 
So if you open it up, then you, you can see the barrier strips here. So I use two different types of barrier strips. On the right side, I have the, the Euro style, they usually call it on the website. And they are not meant to connect multiple wires to one, to one input. So you have one wire going in and one going out. Well, on the other side, I wanted to distribute uh, the current across the, the multiple lines. So for example, all, all of these are, lines, are wires bringing five volt from the power supply. And you can't see it that well on this picture, but there are these metal brackets here that you use them to, that are used to connect the, the, sep the multiple wires. So it spreads uh, the current across it. Next point, the software of the board, of the board form. Um, for controlling all the GPIOs, uh, so I have uh, I2C GPIO expander on the boards with the optocoupler. So I use a very simple script to enable, to add those to the system. And after that, you can uh, toggle the lines using CSFS. So interesting to notice here that I use the direction uh, a special file inside CSFS and not the actual value. So because uh, first you have to switch it, the line to output, and only after that you can set the value. And if you and uh, you cannot switch it to output and to uh, high in atomic operation, which means you will see a small spike. So I found out that if I just out, then I assert the line. If I switch it to in, I de-assert the line. If I would switch it to out first and then echo 0 or 1 into the value special file, then I would have uh, a small uh, glitch on the signal when I first switch it to the output and it would, uh, would trigger something on the board. Uh, yeah, this is using the CSFS uh, API. Uh, I should try the new GPIO character de device interface. I hope that uh, Linus Valle's presentation about that will explain it to me how to, to use it well. Other parts on the software side for the Belibre Acme. Uh, they provide software that integrates with SIGROC. They have a GUI to monitor uh, power management stuff, but for most cases, I just use the, co uh, the command line, uh, which shows me per probe, uh, how much power it consumes, the current going through it, and at which voltage. Uh, for controlling the power through ACME, uh, you can also use the SIGROC uh, command line interface, but I also uh, decided to using uh, the GPIO CSFS interface because it was more convenient for me. One to thing to watch out with the ACME is that uh, after power up, it powers on all boards, which is not necessarily what you want to do. So I changed uh, one line in the, the ACME init script and then that problem went away. Yeah, to control all the boards in the form, I then ended up with uh, a big collection of scripts. So I can control main power and then port f power for the individual boards. And I created a, a script to parse the output from the, the ACME device, so I can have a list of all the boards there and the current power consumption, and also the total power consumption, as you notice, that's much lower than what I had uh, uh, designed the system for. So <laughs> these, uh, yeah. Usually they are really absolute maximum ratings, and if the boards are idle, they, they consume uh, much less power than, uh, than advertised. <laughs> No, of course, if you start using 3D graphics and uh, some other multimedia thing, then uh, power consumption may go up. For booting boards and NFS route, it's not different than a board on your desk, so I'm not going to say anything about that. Uh, things I want to add in the future is automatic booting, which is what uh, is needed for uh, for kernelci.org, for example, and then you can start doing boot testing, auto bisecting regressions, and whatever. And yeah, maybe I will join Kernel CI uh, one day. But I went to their website, and there I saw some uh, something that worried me a lot. 
So in the frequently asked questions, it says, how can I participate by sending us your boards? I guess that's not the only way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know that. Uh. If we send you our boards, can we do our work for us as well? I'm sorry? If we send our boards to them, will they do the work for us as well? If you send a check with the board. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't know. Do, do, do you have uh, re real reset control and wake up buttons and things like that going on? Good. So what, what, I, what I said earlier today in the Kernel CI talk is that there's an easy way and a hard way to get board support. The easy way is to send us your boards and we'll do it. Mm. The, hard, the, the hard way or the other way is to do what you've done essentially. Set it up yourself and just contribute the results. Yeah. Both are, both are rolling on. Mm. Setting up your own labs is the best way because it actually scales. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, I created the slides before the presentations. Sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, yeah, so. Finally, so my board form fulfills my requirements, so I can now do everything I used to do on my desk. So I'm happy, but you may want to do other things. So uh, one thing you may want to do is add JTAG to the system for all the boards. That's actually not that difficult because it's uh, uh, a fly swatter connect just to USB, so you can add it. But more advanced things like video out, uh, board sharing for mul multiple people, and virtualize the network and the system so that multiple users of your farm don't interact with each other. Uh, I know Magnus Dam has some, sitting on the back row, he has some things like that in his, his board form, but I haven't looked into uh, that myself. Uh, so, yeah, what. Uh, what have I learned by doing this? You always learn things. Uh, one thing is I improve my soldering skills, especially with the uh, high density connectors. It's, <laughs> it's always good to have. Uh, I was a bit surprised to, I had bought some load resistors for the PC power supply and then I discovered I don't need them at all. So that's good. And yeah, it takes longer than you expect to get everything set up nicely the way you want. So it starts from an idea, oh, let's make a board form, look into the details. So I wanted to get everything right first before I started ordering components. So I looked into how, how, all the, how I could control all the boards, input pins, uh, because I, I didn't want to get in the situation where I moved the board from my desk to the board form and then I couldn't do the, the daily work anymore. Things that uh, can be improved. Uh, it could use some automation, some better user interface for controlling the boards. Right now I'm using all the, uh, the scripts. It's fine. It works fine with co uh, command line completion and history in bash and things like that. For the boards with the opto isolators, I really like to create my own PCB. It's something I never did before and I like to do that just for the fun. The power supply, power distribution uses a, a Lego case right now. Uh, probably I should put it in some real box. And for the whole form, it's sitting on a table. I probably need some uh, better furniture for that. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, some people for uh, a various thing. They're listed here. And I think we have four more minutes for questions. Like that. Let's please, uh, do we have a speak uh, microphone somewhere here for questions? Yes. Can you talk a bit about, about more about that? So if I have, for example, two Raspberry Pis, originally before I talked, I would have just connected the GTIs together. So you can just elaborate what can go wrong. Uh, well, the issue is that if, if something goes wrong, wrong on one board, it may take down the other board. That's basically the, the issue. And if you have one Raspberry Pi controlling 10 other boards, and one of those 10 other boards, you make a silly mistake there, and it takes down your whole form. That's not something that you want. Okay. Thank you. So a lot of us have a board farm type thing already, and maybe they we focus on different aspects. You seem to focus on a lot of the I.O. on the board. Maybe I focus on networking. Do you get any thoughts on how we could create a generic descriptor format for what our board farm looks like? So like I can connect 
my test framework to your board form without having to worry about all these other details? Because I know I already have something in simple JSON, how you connect to the board, the device. Ooh, that's uh, yeah. would, would be nice to have, I guess. <laughs> No more questions? Thank you very much. I hope uh, the people who don't have a board form yet will start making one. Okay. <laughs>